I only focus on my small business at home and don't do much of the house chores. That's why my mother-in-law started making me comments again. My name's Susan, and I'm 32 years old. I design websites and work from home. I live with my husband, John, and his mom in the house where John grew up. Before I got married, I had a job at a company. But after getting married, I decided to work for myself as a web designer from home. Most of my work comes from people who know me from my old job. They liked my work, so they keep giving me projects. It's a good deal for both of us. I don't have to spend time commuting and I can focus on my household responsibilities. My old boss and I are both happy with how things are going. My mother-in-law doesn't like that I work from home. She thinks a wife should focus on taking care of the house and supporting her husband, like in the old days. But times have changed and many couples both work now. My husband John tries to explain this to her, but she still insists that I should do more housework since I earn the money. She doesn't really understand my job and keeps calling it a home business. Even though I try to balance my work and chores, she's still not happy. Maybe she sees me as the woman who took her son away from her. Since we got married, she's been making sarcastic comments about me and seems to dislike everything I do. John says she relies on him more since his dad passed away, about five years ago. It annoys him sometimes, but he also seems to like feeling needed by his mom. Our house, in a neighborhood, was bought by John's dad 30 years ago. His life insurance paid off the rest of the mortgage, so now it's in his mom's name. It's just right for the three of us, and there's a room for me to work, which is great. My mother-in-law has lived here for 30 years and has lots of friends nearby who visit often. When they come, I have to stop working to serve them tea and snacks. And when they get together, they always talk about their daughters-in-law. One says her daughter-in-law runs to her parents' house over small problems and is hardly home. Another says her daughter-in-law spends too much money, causing problems for her son. I hear these conversations from my workspace and can't help but laugh. They seem to compete over who has the worst daughter-in-law, never saying anything good about them. When one friend praises me for managing work and house chores, my mother-in-law doesn't seem happy. She dismisses my work as just a small business and wonders how much I make. Then another friend talks about how her wife spends her part-time job money on herself, while her husband's money is for everyone. They all laugh. My mother-in-law starts talking about how things were different in her day, but I tune her out with my headphones. I've heard these stories before, and they often disrespect modern wives. I focus on my work and block out the noise. One evening at dinner, John casually mentioned wanting to buy a new car. I've been thinking about getting a new car. Is that okay? He asked. My mother-in-law snapped back, wondering why he needed my permission. John quickly tried to calm her down, saying it would be a car for all of us, so he couldn't decide on his own. Despite John's explanation, my mother-in-law kept arguing with him. Since you're the only one with a driver's license, you should choose the car you want, she insisted. Poor John, who usually listens to his mother, looked at me for help. You decide, he said, feeling stuck. Frustrated, I told him, fine, don't keep asking for your wife's opinion, just make the decision yourself. John always checks with either me or his mother about everything. It's nice that he's considerate, but sometimes it's frustrating how unsure he can be. His dad, my father-in-law, used to make decisions on his own, and my mother-in-law often complained about it. Growing up seeing this, John thinks it's wrong to be too assertive. But my mother-in-law, who had a controlling husband, believes that's how a husband should be. My mother-in-law's dissatisfaction with John always seeking approval falls on me. She blames me, saying, Susan is always nagging John. That's why he's like this. I was surprised and didn't know how to respond. John chimed in, blaming me too, saying, yeah, Susan is always complaining. That's why I can't decide on my own. I tried to defend myself, but it didn't help. John always takes his mother's side. We've been married for two years, but he's never stood up for me in front of her. He apologizes later, saying I'm the most important to him, but I'm losing trust. He seemed caring at first, but he never backs me up. I'm starting to question our relationship. Kindness and indecisiveness are different. I wish he'd stand up to his mother. About a month later, John's new car arrived. The smell of a new car is the best. Let's all go for a drive on my next day off, he said happily. His excitement spread, even to my mother-in-law. She commented on the car's cost, hinting it was paid from John's salary. Ignoring her, John enjoyed exploring the car. 
I was shocked at its expense. There's a limit, even though I said he could choose, I thought. John came inside, still thrilled. I asked, how much did it cost? He casually replied, $60,000. Seeing my reaction, he asked, but you said I could get any car, right? My mother-in-law quickly sided with my husband, saying, you let John decide, so don't complain now. While I did leave the decision to him, I also hope he consider our finances. Ignoring her, I asked my husband, where's the money coming from? He hesitated, then admitted he was paying with a loan. Instead of addressing this, my mother-in-law shouted, Susan, don't complain, you're not the one paying. I wasn't sure if she was mad because I ignored her, or because of what I said to my husband, but she gave me a fierce glare. You're always complaining, even though you're living off John's salary, she said harshly. I defended myself, saying, I have a job too. But my mother-in-law dismissed it, saying I didn't earn much with my part-time job compared to John's $5,000 a month. I was about to explain that was my salary, but when I looked for my husband, he had disappeared. I couldn't take it anymore. My mother-in-law even went as far as saying she wanted a daughter-in-law like me to leave soon. I had been patient, but I was done. Discussing my salary seemed ridiculous, and I didn't care anymore. Feeling frustrated with my mother-in-law's comments and my husband's attitude, I couldn't understand why he caused this argument in the first place. His usual indecisiveness had sparked it all over again. Okay, I'll leave then, I said, heading to my home office. I grabbed my laptop and essentials and left the house, telling my mother-in-law I'd come back for the rest of my stuff later. She glared at me with a frightening expression while my husband stayed in his room. As I left, my still angry mother-in-law shouted, make sure you've signed the divorce papers next time you come here. Did you hear me? It shocked me to hear her use such harsh language for the first time. Ignoring her, I stormed out of my in-law's house. I wasn't sure if she was angry because I said I would leave as she asked, or because I confronted my husband about the money. Regardless, I knew I wanted to leave that house as soon as possible. After storming out of my husband's parents' house, I went back to my own parents' house for the time being. My mom was surprised and asked what happened suddenly. My dad, seeing my unusual expression, seemed to understand the situation. I don't know what happened, but you can stay here as long as you need to, he assured me. I didn't hear from my husband afterward. The man who used to cherish me before our marriage was nowhere to be found. I couldn't help but feel foolish for not seeing that he only listened to his mother. Talking to my parents about what happened at my husband's house helped calm me down. You don't have children, so it's better to divorce sooner rather than later, my mom advised, and I agreed. On the weekend, my father helped me move my belongings out of my husband's house. My husband was nowhere to be found, and my mother-in-law stayed in her room. Standing outside my husband's room, I called out, Thank you for everything. Could you sign the divorce papers? I slid the papers under the door. I signed. Is this okay? came my husband's curt voice from behind the door, along with the signed papers. It saddened me that our marriage had come to this. Without saying anything to my mother-in-law, I left my husband's house. I had lived there for about two years, but there weren't many good memories. I headed straight to the city hall and submitted the divorce papers. I wanted to settle everything quickly, if possible. After the divorce, I stayed at my parents' house and continued working there. I thought about renting a room and living alone, but my mom insisted I stay with them for safety reasons. My dad agreed, worried about John and his mom possibly causing trouble. Though I didn't think they would, I felt more comfortable being with my parents. Luckily, I could work from anywhere, so I decided to stay home for a while. About two months passed, and I had almost forgotten about my ex-husband and ex-mother-in-law when I started getting calls from an unknown number. At first I thought it might be a wrong number, so I didn't answer but the calls kept coming. Reluctantly, I listened to my ex-husband's voice on the phone. Why didn't you answer sooner? He sounded flustered. It's an unknown number, and besides, we're not connected anymore, so I was going to hang up. I replied, ready to end the call. But then he rushed to say, wait, wait, I can't get my smartphone to work. Why is that? He sounded desperate. I'm not sure. You should contact your phone company, I suggested. Then something dawned on me. Did you not deposit money into your bank account when we were married? I used to deposit money from my salary for public utilities. His salary went into the same account, but it was usually a small amount. He sold health food products, but his income was low because of the commission system. 
Some people made good money with lots of orders, but he didn't do as well. He mostly received the basic salary, so only a few hundred dollars went into the account. I had been depositing money into the payment account every month, but for the past three months, it was only his salary. The argument about the car and me leaving the house happened in the middle of the month. That meant the payment for the new car might have already started. My ex-husband fell silent on the other end of the phone. I've been managing everything with my own salary. From now on, you'll have to figure it out on your own, I informed him. I wanted to say Sergio, but I held back and hung up the phone. My ex-husband probably never told his mother how much he earned. She didn't realize that most of our expenses were covered by my salary since our marriage. John must have felt embarrassed to admit he earned less than his wife. I later learned that utilities like electricity and water are not easily shut off. The first thing to go is usually cell phone service. A few days later, on a quiet weekend morning, the doorbell at my house rang loudly. My dad answered and started arguing with someone at the front door. Seeing my usually calm father so angry, I knew something was wrong. My mom and I went to see what was happening. We have nothing to do with you anymore, so leave, my dad said firmly. My heart raced when I heard my ex-mother-in-law's voice demanding to see me. Just as my dad had predicted, she had come all the way to our home. When she saw me, my ex-mother-in-law started yelling at me with a terrifying expression on her face. Because you stopped depositing money into the account, the electricity and water got cut off. My parents and I were shocked. What did she mean by that? Just then, my ex-husband arrived, desperately trying to intervene. Mom, stop it. This has nothing to do with Susan. But my ex-mother-in-law ignored John's attempts and kept yelling. John makes $5,000. Why would the electricity and water get cut off? You're mistaken. I'm the one who makes $5,000. I corrected her, finally able to speak up about what I hadn't been able to before. My ex-mother-in-law looked surprised at my words, then turned to John. That's right, it wasn't my salary, it was all Susan's, he admitted, looking defeated. How can you earn so much with a part-time job? My ex-mother-in-law looked at me as if I had tricked her. I've told you before, it's not a part-time job, it's a real job. I replied firmly. My ex-mother-in-law's face paled. How much does John make? She asked, her voice barely audible. About $500 net, he answered quietly. There was a moment of silence, then my ex-mother-in-law said something unbelievable. Susan, can't you come back? The whole weave us thing was a joke, she pleaded, her tone low and submissive. It reminded me of someone trying to butter me up. What are you talking about? I'm divorced. I have nothing to do with you two anymore. I declined firmly, but my ex-mother-in-law continued to plead with me in a familiar, overly familiar way. You can just remarry John. If we start the paperwork now, it'll be fine. My dad intervened when I was too shocked to respond. We're done with you. If you don't leave right now, we'll call the police, he warned, his voice firm. My ex-husband and ex-mother-in-law hurriedly left at the sound of my dad's intimidating tone. If you show up again, I'm calling the cops right away, my father warned them as they left. What a bunch of uncalf people, my mother remarked, astonished. My father seemed even more furious. I'm glad you got out of that marriage, Susan. Later on, I heard updates about my ex-family from one of John's friends. John ended up selling his family home and land, moving into an apartment with his mother. He sold the new car too, using the proceeds to pay off remaining debts. However, instead of settling down, John wasted all his money on gambling. He vanished without a trace, leaving his mother behind, who developed dementia and had to be placed in a care facility. Meanwhile, I focused on my job and started living alone. Recently, I've begun dating a man I met through work. He's understanding about my divorce and is committed to his job. He's nothing like John, who relied on his wife's money for expensive purchases. Though we're not engaged yet, we both feel a strong connection and can see a future together.